Yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody to the College of Complexes. Uh, if you're um, talking and you have some other uh, places to go, I'd like to have your attention up front, please. I'd like to call the College of Complexes into session tonight. My name is Tim. I'll be helping to moderate tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the uh, following four elements. First, we'll have a brief discussion. We will have a brief announcements uh, page where we have local events of the community and that kind of thing. And we ask for announcements and not speeches at that time. The second part is we will have our speaker who will speak up to an hour or whatever happens there. And, and then after his speech, we'd like to have a questions period. And let's keep it with questions only. Uh, because that's what we're there for. And at the end of the question period, you will then have your chance to get up and have your say. And it's usually about four to five minutes long, depending on how many people we hear. At uh, 8.45, we do have to be out uh, ready to leave the restaurant as they do close at nine o'clock. All right, tonight's talk is going to be with Hassan El Tayyab. El Tayyab. El Tayyab, organizer. And he's talking tonight about the Chicago Area Peace Action, the nation's largest grassroots peace network with chapters and affiliates in states across the country. We organize our network to place pressure on Congress and the administration through writing campaigns, internet actions, citizen lobbying, and direct action. Through a close relationship with progressive leaders in Congress, we play a key role in devising strategies to move forward peace legislation. As a leading member of various coalitions, we lend our expertise and a large network to achieving common goals. National Peace Association believes that war is not a suitable response to conflict, that every person has a right to live without threat from nuclear weapons, and that America has the resources and responsibility to protect and provide for its citizens. Let's welcome Hassan al Tayyib. Charlie, you got a speech too. <laughs> 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 All right. Let me get it. All right, we'll get started. Let's welcome our speaker tonight. How's it going, everybody? Is this on? It's on. Don't touch it. All right. If you need, if it, if it needs batteries, just don't make it Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Hassan Altayev, and I'm a college advisor Chicago Area Peace Action is an affiliate of Peace Action National, and we're the oldest, largest peace advocacy group in the country. We have 200,000 members all across the United States, and we've been around for about 60 years. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was actually an early supporter of our work, as was MLK. Um, so what do we do? Noam Chomsky once stated that there are two problems facing our species' survival, and that is nuclear war and environmental catastrophe, and we're hurtling towards them both and knowing it. So in response to these threats, CAPA, or Chicago Area Peace Action, works to reduce and eliminate the danger of nuclear weapons and runaway militarism. We promote peace, reject warfare, and we embrace a world free from the devastation of climate change. And we do this by meeting in boardrooms, houses of worship, college campuses, and on the street. So before I dive deeper, I'm going to kind of focus my talk today about the war economy and what we can do about it. Um, but I want to talk to you guys about how the war economy has impacted my life. I guess we need this after all. Huh. Right on the side there. Oh, uh, no, it, it uh, sometimes it uh, it delays itself somewhat. 
All right. Try the arrow, please. Yeah. So, um, so I'm the son of a Jordanian immigrant, and my name actually translated in Arabic means beautiful. But it also meant I'd be a target for racism and hate growing up in America. So I'm used to getting to airports a little early. I'm used to having people mispronounce my name. And I'm used to having people assume things about me that just aren't true. Uh, instances are kind of too many to name, but there's this kid in my social studies class where we're trying to learn about the Declaration of Independence and how we're all created equal. And he basically called me a sand nigger every day while the teacher just sat there in silence. And that was what you know, in fact, a lot of adults just sat there in silence when they probably should have been protecting me. So, you know, my freshman year of college, I saw the tragic events of 9-11 unfold from my college dorm room. I saw it in a TV screen, and it was horrible. And not only was that horrible, but the racist, greedy wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that followed were also horrible. And I saw it firsthand from the mouths of politicians, pundits, strangers, and even my friends and relatives, how racism can turn into public support for war. And I was beyond angry at how our military was being used. So, so, so often, the feeling of being disempowered, I think, holds us back from the best versions of ourselves. And I think, for a long time, I felt like my voice didn't matter. So, what I did is, I had to go on kind of a journey. My, my dad was not really around when I was growing up. So for me to kind of understand my roots, what I had to do is I had to actually travel back to the Middle East and go find my family. My, my mom's Catholic. Actually, one time that kid, Mike Keogh, I was like, man, I, I'm, not, I'm Catholic, man. I'm not Muslim. <laughs> but uh, that didn't really matter. So I went to Jordan, and I got to meet my family, who were some of the most amazing, warm-hearted people I'd ever met. I was met with about, so they, my family lives on one street, and they all, like my uncles, my aunts, they all live in houses adjacent to each other, and they have kids, and those kids actually also have kids, and it's pretty wild. So, um, so this is one thing I saw out there. It's, uh, it's called Petra, and it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. So. And this is me riding a donkey. Uh, this is actually, that's called, that donkey was really sad. Um, so Jordan's a place you don't hear about all that often, but it shares a border with Syria, Iraq, Israel, and the West Bank, and Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia. And my family then knows the cost of war in a very real way, as, as their country has been inundated with refugees. Uh, there's about 1.4 million refugees from Syria alone. Now, and there's also refugees from Palestine, Iraq, and Yemen, and Lebanon. So I wonder what would this, what would this country and what would the Middle East look like without years of foreign intervention by the United States? So. I'm going to read a quote from, from MLK. So, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. The Reverend Martin Luther King at the Riverside Church in New York City, I think just about a year before he, he was assassinated. And so let's talk about what is actually in the military budget. So this was Trump's 2018 uh, discretionary budget request. As you can see, the vast majority of that is going right to the federal, uh, the federal spending is going right to the military. So we're spending about $700 billion on our military budget and funding 800 military bases in more than 70 countries all across the planet. We've got special forces deployed in 149 countries, and even before Trump, the U.S. was involved in seven wars in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. So it's like war just seems to be a bipartisan thing these days. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. It's just part of the way we run our government and run our foreign policy. In addition, the United States, um, so there's a big gap in between what we're spending on the military budget and anti-poverty programs. And this has been consistent 
uh, since the 70s. So, and these are just a, a map of where all these bases overseas are. And it's, we are everywhere. Now, sometimes people, they say, well, you know, Russia's a huge threat. And I say, well, how many bases do they have overseas? One. How many do we have? 800. <laughs> so it's clearly a bit of a mismatch. Nuclear weapon spending. So this is kind of the elephant in the room, I think, um, that we are spending $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years to revamp and modernize all our nuclear weapons. So with the $80 billion increase in this year's military budget alone, I, we could have afforded free public college for everybody in the country. Um, constant war has become a theme and have become a norm whether the administrations are led by Democrats or Republicans and every intervention has led the groundwork for more conflict, more bloodshed, more PTSD, more poverty, more debt, more environmental destruction, and more moral injuries to the soul of our country. The architects of this moral failure claim that we would be all set if we had just sent in more troops or acted more decisively with more brutality. In their view, the problem isn't that America goes to wars, but that we don't go to war enough. I think there's, I think there's some flaws in that logic. So let's talk about poverty in the military. So, so often, uh, so obviously in, um, the United States hasn't had an official draft since the Vietnam, but I'd argue that we've had, actually had an economic draft. Too often the people that make up our all-volunteer military are just trying to escape crushing poverty and just want to get a better chance at life, want to go to college, and they want to achieve the American dream, and this is kind of their only way to get it, too often. And there's a really aggressive JROTC recruitment program that's happening on the south side and west side, and actually all over Chicago. So a, a Chicago area peace action were part of the effort to kind of stop some of those recruitments and show kids that there are other options out there. We're working with Vets for Peace Chicago on that project. So 40% of all the fatalities in Iraq and Afghanistan were actually recruits from our poorest communities. So and that trend, it, the trend is going upward. In Vietnam, it was about 36%. Now it's, we're pushing upwards of 40%. Um, so, and when folks come back, obviously, they're just traumatized. So, I want to just debunk a couple myths about the war economy that I hear. You know, so often, we're, we're kind of told things that we sort of need to take a deeper look at if we want to be able to have a real conversation. So, I think a lot of people would say, and in some senses, they're right, that the primary purpose of our military is defending America. Yeah. So, Chicago Area Peace Action, we are actually not like necessarily like a pacifist organization. We don't believe that we shouldn't have any military, but we want it to be balanced with our other priorities, and we think we need to scale back. So, and so the truth to me, and folks at Peace Action, and what I think it is, is our military is not necessarily being used for defense, but it's being used to consolidate corporate control over gas, oil, resources, pipelines, and maintain military dominance over potential challengers out there. And we're continuing to use it as a justification for our multi-billion dollar war industry. Two, folks will say, but spending on the war machine, that's good for our economy, right? So, the latest research actually finds that there's some holes in this argument, too. So, out of a billion dollars of military spending, about 11,000 jobs are created from the military with a billion dollars of spending. Almost 27,000 jobs are created if we invest that same amount in education. 17,000 jobs would be created if we invested that in the clean energy and uh, 18,000 jobs would be invested, or would, would happen if we invested in healthcare. So there are other ways to impact the economy with this uh, social spending. So lastly, this is, I think, the most 
heinous of, of the myths is that the spending that, that we're putting out there is going to the troops. And you'll hear, we support the troops, so let's spend on them. Okay, so let's talk about that. More than $300 billion of our $700 billion military budget goes straight to corporations. The CEOs of those five biggest weapons contractors each got a salary of almost $20 million last year in a combined total of $100 million. A military general with 20 years of experience gets about $200,000. That ain't right. An army private gets about $30,000 annual, and so often our army privates actually have to survive on food stamps. So, and another thing I wanted to say is that our those same top five weapons contractors in America, the day that the North and South Korea peace deal was sort of struck and they announced an end to the, the Korean War after 70 years of conflict, they lost $10.2 billion in stock value. So on Friday, when they announced that the summit wasn't happening, guess what happened to their stock value? Went right back up. And that's... They're literally banking on endless war, and I think that's a serious conflict of interest. So these numbers say uh, uh, volumes about our values, but I want to dig deeper and talk about the human cost of the war economy. And so one thing that Chicago Area Peace Action has been doing a lot of work on is the Saudi war on Yemen. So um, America has a lot of they're giving a lot of support to Saudi Arabia to fight a war, a civil war in Yemen. And we don't hear about it on the news at all. There's an almost complete media blackout on this situation. But I wanted to tell you about the story Give me of one minute, Fatima Mohammed. How many people here know a bit about the war in Yemen? I just want to know who I'm talking to. So you guys are an educated bunch, so I appreciate talking here. But so often I ask that question and no one even knows where Yemen is. So, just a brief history of the war in Yemen. So, after the Arab Spring, uh, they got rid of Saleh, President Saleh, and they installed uh, the Vice President, who then became the UN-recognized President, President Hadi. And after, you know, during the Arab Spring, there was people tried to overthrow that regime. And Hadi no longer lives in Saudi Arabia. He's actually, I'm sorry, no longer lives in Yemen. He's actually in Saudi Arabia. And the Houthi rebels have, have occupied Sana'a, and they are now in control of what's called North Yemen. This, this red patch, I don't know why it's called North Yemen, because it's, it's, you know, it's west, but that's, what, that's how they refer to it. And then the other side is um, South Yemen. Just a couple of facts about Yemen. That's where the Queen of Sheba is from. It's also where coffee was first brewed and where the word mocha comes from. I love ice mochas, and so I'm very appreciative of the people of Yemen. So let me tell you about this child's family. Fatima Muhammad Ali and her two young sons were planting vegetables on her family's farm in Yemen last year when a Saudi coalition airstrike launched bombs provided by the United States, and they suddenly hit the family's home. The blast demolished the house, and across the fields where they were looking um, was a swing set, and Ali's 10-year-old daughter, Abir, who was on the swing set, was instantly killed. Fearful that they could, hit by, could be hit by another missile attack, Ali's family left the farm and found a place to dig a bunker, which Ali described as a big hole covered with curtains. But without the family's farm and produce to eat and sell, they struggled to survive, and the family's three-month-year-old Ishraq was diagnosed with severe malnutrition, and this is her. Our children cry every day and every night because of lack of food and clean water, Ali told a reporter at the hospital. There are times I wish for death instead of living this life. The UN says that this is one of the worst places in the world to be a child. Um, the people of Yemen have been in uh, the throes of a devastating civil war for three years now, and the Saudi blockade and airstrikes have actually targeted hospitals. 
schools, and other civilian infrastructure, all with our help. Eight million people are on the brink of famine, and one million people have cholera, making it the worst cholera epidemic in human history. And the frustrating part to me is that cholera can actually be cured just with clean water. I wanted to take a second and I'm not sure if we can get this. I wanted us to hear from the, the voices of some children from Yemen. This is a very short video, but I think they say it better than I ever could. So just, just unwrap the mic. Unwrap the mic. Here. It's all subtitles, so. But it really gets suspenseful. Here, I'll. Uh, sorry about that. I like your guys' style here, by the way. <laughs> get that for you. Okay. It's just, yeah, well, actually, it's just pretty simple. Yeah, you in this conflict in a number of ways. We can just go to the next slide. No, 
the noise your husband is? Be quiet. Be quiet. Why don't you be quiet? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for your patience. You could be a tech guy. Um, yeah, you could. So the United States is complicit in this conflict by selling weapons to the Saudi Arabian government. And we're providing intelligence and bombing runs and doing mid-air fueling for their bombing campaigns. And our Navy is also helping block the ports of Yemen, stopping the flow of water, fuel, medicine into the country, which under international law is a war crime. So just last week, the Saudi coalition actually targeted a wedding, wedding killing about 30 people, including the bride. And they've actually been targeting Doctors Without Borders hospitals. They've actually hit four Doctors Without Borders hospitals. So I kind of went into this. So this is, this is a guy I respect a lot. I, I love Bernie. Bernie introduced bipartisan legislation with uh, Senator Lee and Senator Murphy. So we had an independent, a Republican, and a Democrat introduce SJ Res 54. Um, and that was basically invoking the War Powers Resolution which in 1973, Peace Action actually was part of the coalition that helped pass that bill in the first place after Vietnam, just a piece of history there. But uh, it basically would have ended U.S. support for the Saudi war in Yemen, ending uh, sales of weapons, ending mid-air fueling campaigns, and CAPA or Chicago Area Peace Action, we led the state effort to get co-sponsors in Illinois for this bill. And we, we're proud to say we got uh, Senator Durbin as one of the first co-sponsors of the bill. So I, I personally met with his staff in D.C. and here in district. So uh, we put big push. We got about 20,000 phone calls into that office through that, that stop war number. So we worked with Avaz and move on as well. So we're hoping to get, um, we're, there's another amendment so this actually, unfortunately, uh, lost. It lost. We got 44 votes for the bill, and um, I think 55 opposed it. So, but still, when you introduce bipartisan legislation, good things can happen. And we're finding that there are Republicans starting to really take notice of what's going on in Yemen. And there met, might be a window in hopefully this year or maybe in the following year for us to create a piece of legislation that really gets it. So one, so actually, before I go into that, so how do we end endless wars? So Kappa, we have a couple philosophies that we try to employ. We work to empower people on the receiving end of these policies and amplify their voices. And we think they must be the central story of change. So what we did in, to you know, exemplify this piece is that we invited Yemen-born activist and Harvard scholar, Dr. Shireen Aladiemi, to speak at our Loyola chapter. And she gave a really powerful speech on this conflict, which touched all of us. So we also focus on the most egregious cases, and so we think if we no. really work on the Saudi Arabian war on Yemen, and if we really work on the Iran nuclear deal and diplomacy with North Korea, that we can start shifting the narrative. So those are the three top issues we're working on. Uh, we're also working on a move the money campaign. So we're, we're working to try to divest pensions to best our cities and state governments from the war economy because we, we feel that there's if we keep giving it money keep you know supplying the war economy we're just going to perpetuate this misery around the world and lastly we're working to help people understand cross issues and we need to make the connection between the manufacturers selling weapons um, to shoot up our schools and the manufacturers selling weapons to shoot up schools in Saudi Arabia. We think that there's, you know, there's an ideological connection that connects the two. And I think we're more powerful when we work in coalition. So, speaking.
speaking of coalition work, I'm also on the uh, leadership team of the Poor People's Campaign in Illinois. And we actually have a war economy rally that's happening in Springfield. I might be getting arrested. I, so on Monday. What? Oh, thank you. you guys come on say hi anytime. So we're trying to fulfill MLK's last wish of a nationwide moral revival. And we want to rid the society of four pillars of evil. Poverty, racism, the war economy, and ecological devastation. And this multi-year campaign is kicking off with 40 days of nonviolent action uh, that started, I believe, on on Mother's Day. So, and let me know if anybody would like to get involved in that. So, so the first Poor People's Campaign happened in 1968. MLK was kind of on the ropes. He gave that Beyond Vietnam speech, and his coalition <coughs> broke apart. Um, and then he got a call from. Uh, Bobby Kennedy and he said bring the poor people to DC so there was this huge march and that sort of kick-started the poor people's campaign and unfortunately he could never see it realized because he was assassinated soon after so we're trying to invoke the spirit of nonviolent moral fusion action and try to you know fulfill his last wish of, a, of America so um, so off of that, so this is Reverend Barber. He's kind of the spokesperson of the campaign. So this is us, <laughs> peace action. This is our meeting in DC. Kappa has what we like to call an inside outside strategy. Uh, Tim spoke a little bit about how we get this done, but we, you know, we do a lot of direct lobbying with Congress. I have relationships. I'm, you know, I became the policy and organizing director. So my job is to build relationships with uh, senior level staff in DC and in district of, uh, we're, we're really focused on congressional districts one through 10. That's a large turf for one dude. I'm telling you, it's, it's a lot of work, but we're, we're doing the best we can, all the way from Bobby Rush to Brad Schneider. And we focus on, um, we actually might be going on to Bill Foster's district too. But eventually we want to expand to the whole state. So, and we're constantly monitoring legislation on the House floor and the Senate floor. We have a great, um, a great policy analyst and advocate in D.C. Who's, who's our chief lobbyist, and his name's Paul Kowicka Martin. And he just sort of has a uh, pulse on the heartbeat of what's going on with this legislation. So that he feeds us back information. We try to do in-district action, or really kind of move the needle. So another one of our goals is to train uh, college and high school students because we think that we don't do this work well if we're not teaching it to the next generation. So we've started uh, chapters at Loyola, we're about to start one at DePaul, and we've got about three high school chapters set up and they're constantly growing. We've also started a summer fellowship program where we've got uh, college and high school interns canvassing for peace all summer long and I think that's a great way to kind of keep the peace movement going so this was us in a lobby meeting with Jan Schakowsky where we got her to sign uh, the no first use with nuclear weapons HR 669 so I want to tell you a little bit like how this work looks like what it actually looks like like and how Kappa has succeeded in this work. So this is Representative Danny Davis, and we were a long time trying to get him on. Actually, how many people here believe that Trump shouldn't be able to launch a first strike with a nuclear weapon? Yeah. Just raise your hand. Okay. Some people might disagree with that. I think I don't think anybody should be able to launch a first strike with a nuclear weapon. Any one person. So we think that might be a better decision to have Congress, because Congress, under constitutional authority, they have the right to declare war. So why not give them also the right to launch a first strike with a nuclear weapon? Let, let's have an open debate and then give them the authority to do that. So we wanted to get Danny Davis to sign H.R. 669, co-sponsor. And so I met with his chief of staff, uh, well, deputy chief of staff, Caleb Gilchrist, in uh, DC, 
we had a nice conversation, didn't end up happening. So, you know, like a good lobbyist activist does, you stalk your congressman. That's all you gotta do. So I went to a, uh, a lobby visit in district, still didn't happen. So we followed him to a town hall. So we brought, brought, uh, brought a bunch of Kappa activists into the town hall. We told them all about HR 669. Um, and basically, we cornered him in front of everybody. I had one of our activists say, what do you think we should do about North Korea? And he stands there, he's like, well, I think uh, we gotta rein in Trump. And I shot my hand up, I said, well, go on record and co-sponsor HR 669, man. It's never been easier. And I had the video rolling and sure enough, he, he said he would do it. So I guess my point here is that this work, this lobbying work that Chicago Area Peace Action is doing, it, it is really effective stuff. The only thing is we need more help to do it. So, and what I would suggest if anybody wants to get involved is to get on our email list. I have... What are you trying to do? I wanted to pass out, this is our email list here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll I can do that for you. Okay. Thanks, just go ahead. So, get on our email list, you can run a table at an event if you're so inspired, make calls to activate supporters, and or host a house event to raise awareness. I could give this talk to you and 10, 15 of your friends if you'd like to, or lead a community meeting. Um, another thing you could do is I gave donation envelopes to all of you. If anybody felt the urge and wanted to help support this work and become a member, uh, that would be very helpful to sustain this peace work in Chicago. And I just wanted to say thank you all for this platform to give this talk, and I appreciate your support. So thank you so much. Okay. Are you up for questions now, sir? I'm up for some questions if you guys have. Them. Okay. Um, I'd like to know, you, you said you're involved with like four pillars, you know, ecological peace um, and, and a couple of others. I'd like to know where your group stands on nuclear power for, for right now, if you could elaborate. Well, yeah, so we actually collaborate with NEIS, the Nuclear <laughs> Energy Information Service, and we, we follow their lead on nuclear power. We think that nuclear power is essentially a nuclear bomb waiting to happen. Um, and so, and we also think it's not necessarily the most efficient way and the best solution because there's so much upfront cost to create a nuclear power plant. I say, let's go into renewable energy. So. Yeah, I, th I thought you were gonna sing a song. Oh, I could definitely sing a song. Let's do some questions oh, now, end with a tune. Okay. I, I never go anywhere without the guitar. <laughs> but Good. In, my, in my past life, I'm a, I was a singer-songwriter. I toured a lot, and I now teach songwriting at Old Town School of Folk, so. Okay, I still don't understand. Why is that war going on over there? The Yemen? Is it, is it a religious thing? Why is it happening? Well, to call, you know, it's a good question. The people of Yemen, they're fiercely independent and don't want a puppet government. They want to run their own lives. They want to shape their own destiny. Just like the revolutionary soldiers in our the American Revolution want. So I think we can relate to that as Americans, why you'd want your own country. Is it a religious thing? You know, it's, it's overblown. I think it's really about autonomy. They want to control their own government. They, uh, they, and they don't want Saudi Arabia to control them. And so, if we go back a little bit. Isn't there a Sunni Shia thing going on? I'll explain that in a second. So, there is 3.8 billion uh, million gallons of oil a day going out through this, um, through this strait here. And so, Saudi Arabia really has a, um, is invested in controlling Yemen as a strategic point. Now, there, I th the politics of Sunni Shia in this co in this conflict way overblown. And if anybody wants more information, I would recommend that you get on Kappa's email list first. But then also check out. Um, there's a, a Carnegie released a uh, study. It's called Iran's Small Hands in Yemen, 
And it basically, so one of the arguments you hear from conservatives is, is that they're, they're Shia, they're part of Iran, and they're actually a totally different sect of Shia. And in fact, Iran said to the Houthis, please, do not overthrow Saddam. Do not do that. And the Houthis said, this is our thing, man. We're going to go ahead and do this. So they overthrew it, and now that's where this is. So there's, and there's also blockades all around the country. So the fact that Iran's getting weapons into Yemen is actually a non-starter. It's not really happening because there are yeah, they're blockades all over. So, um, and yeah, I think this is about, uh, you know, self govern and being able to govern yourself and not be run by a puppet government. Why does Saudi Arabia want to go into the power? Can you uh, can you speak a little louder? Yeah, please? she I can. I, she wanted to know okay. why does Saudi Arabia have so much interest in Yemen, and part of it is they want control of the Red Sea and this little spot right here to be able to get oil through and in, in out and be able to distribute oil to their. Uh, people that they distribute oil. What, what's the name of those straits, by the way? Straits of Hormuz. Yes, uh, he just okay. said it. Does that, does that, and, uh, I'm just wondering, does Kappa have a position on Israel and Palestine? Yes, we do. What is it? We support a two-state solution and we support the peace process. We think that the recent killings uh, by Israel uh, for the, the Palestinian pro uh, the Palestinian protesters is a war crime. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, le legal immigration is about uh, a million people a year. Legal immigration. Illegal is about a million people a year. Uh, 90% of these are non-white. Do you think this is a, a plot by George Soros to weaken America? I, I, I do. You know, I mean, I could talk to you about that as a citizen, but I can't talk to you about that as a representative of Chicago Area Peace Action because that's not really our focus right now. But um, you're a progressive, aren't you? I'm a progressive, yeah. Now, I don't think it's a... I mean, so right now I'm taking my cap a hat off because this... This is not part of Chicago Area Peace Action. We're a peace organization. We're nonpartisan, and we work with Republicans and Democrats to get peace policy passed. Like I said, we, we were working on bipartisan legislation. We tried we tried to get Rand Paul. To, yeah, Rand Paul was a supporter of that H. Um, sorry, the SJ Res 54. Saying that first, as far as George Soros, I I mean to me, I just personally think that people trying to flee for a better life should be adopted. If I want, if I was going to say how do we fix the immigration issue, it's obviously a contentious issue. I would focus on wage enforcement of, you know, the companies exploiting this labor and try to get them into the system. So I heard George Soros got kicked out of Hungary because you're bringing all these refugees in. I yeah. read that in the paper last week. Yeah, you know, I'm maybe a little bit out of my area of expertise. Uh, you know, I would defer to you and anybody else that wanted to talk about that subject, but it's not really the focus of my talk or peace action, so. Is there anything that uh, we could hear you about ISIS? About ISIS? Um, I mean, I would support diplomacy in the Middle East. And when you support diplomacy, you create a stabilized region. So one thing we should stop doing is selling weapons and supporting Saudi Arabia because they are the exporters of so much terrorism. They are the exporters of a form of Islam called Wahhabism. And that is where so much of the extremist um, uh, voices in Islam are coming from. That's where the 9-11 attackers came from. So I would say if we and this really toxic relationship we have with Saudi Arabia, that could be a great first start. Um, and also trying to you know, really uh, pressure Israel uh, for peace with Palestine, because that, that's also a rallying cry of so many people in the Arab world. Well, th this historian said that the invasion of Iraq was the biggest blunder in American history. What do you think of that? I mean, was it the, we've done a lot of big blunders. I think maybe like nuking Japan was one of them. 
Um, Vietnam yeah, was one of them. Minute. The invasion of Iraq Everybody's was definitely also hours. one of them. I don't, I, it's hard to, you know, figure out which one's worse. I think overthrowing the elected leader of Iran was also one of them. Look at all the blowback that's happening with our foreign policy now. And is even questions, maybe they're going to start developing a nuclear weapon now that we've pulled out of the Iran deal. So, that answer, yeah. Everybody? All right. No, 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 no camera, please, Tim. All right. I'm not feeling uh, Listen, I have a question. So, just your opinion, like, subjective, objective. Can you speak up a little louder? Yeah. Just your opinion, your opinion. Yes. Yeah. What do you think about Putin and Syria? Putin and Syria? Yeah, because, like, so far they met only one country. Like, what, what's going on? What's your opinion about Russia and Syria? Yeah, I mean, so I support finding a diplomatic solution in Syria. It can be very difficult. Obviously, I think what Assad is doing is terrible. What the United States was doing was terrible. What Russia was doing is terrible. I mean, there's a lot of problems going on in that country. Um, a future going to be peaceful? Or yeah, think be I, I think it's also, we have to realize as Americans, I think, that there isn't a solution to every single problem in the Middle East. And sometimes the best solution is just advocate for peace talks and, you know, push for diplomacy. So, we, you know, and often, so often all we have is, you know, we try to fix these really complex issues with our ideology and our nuclear weapons and our bombs, and it's just not, it's not helping the situation, so. You know, since um, there's such pressure, you know, so, so much profit in wars. Yeah. So much money in wars. And Wall Street loves wars. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's just, it's awful. Your organization be, be in favor of my initiative of cutting all military budgets in half around the world and have that very severely enforced? Um, you know, I mean, every country. I personally, I would love that. <laughs> there's probably ten trillion dollars a year. Yeah, right now, Chicago area peace action, peace action. We actually want to cut the Pentagon budget by about 25%. No, 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 no. Every military yeah. budget. I mean, I'm all for it. Um, <laughs> sign up and help us out. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm all for that idea. And I, I think it's a wonderful uh, trajectory. Yeah, without everybody else. You know, but it's unfortunately, I, I try to control what I have the power to do. And I live in, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I'm a constituent here so I'm I'm working on that that larger goal of world peace but I'm doing it in the best way I can and focusing yeah, on too much money yeah too much profit, I completely agree too much Wall I don't understand why there's a war going on but why aren't we dealing with the, with the sickness in Yemen the, the cholera why are we why can't we deal with that um, well, because of this destructive relationship I was talking about with Saudi Arabia. So they, were, they, they were murdering people. Saudi so Arabia. It's not, this, is the, this is for kids. Kids are getting killed. I completely agree. Men. And it's because of the, the blockade that's happening that's actually being supported by our Navy. So one easy step is just everybody call your member of Congress and call your senators and say, uh, support or introduce legislation that would end U.S. involvement in the Saudi war in Yemen. That's, I think that's the best way to go about that. Because once we open up the ports, medicine, fuel can get in. So right now, not that can happen. Uh, well, there is one one spot where supplies can get in, but you know, it's it's not not all. You know, that's it's just not enough resources for getting into the country. And this is a country that imports most of its food anyway. So in peacetime, it's still importing a lot of its food. So when you cut off uh, the ports, then you, they're very vulnerable. And that's why you have 8 million people on the brink of famine. And 22 million people who are food insecure. I saw a hand back up over yeah. there. Okay, so I'm assuming that the reason why the U.S. is supporting the Saudi is that they're saying, I'm guessing that, uh, that they're indirectly fighting ISIS that way or something. And, I mean, what what is Saudi Arabia's stated reason for being involved 
with Yemen and the, or is that the Yemenis are attacking them or what's going on? So, uh, it, that's a good question and let me kind of break down a couple things. So, we have a very odd policy. So the Houthis in the country are actually fighting Al-Qaeda. Let me say that, say that again. Houthis in Yemen are fighting our enemy in Al-Qaeda. And Saudi Arabia is teaming up with Al-Qaeda to attack the Houthis. And here's a head scratcher. We're also drone bombing Al-Qaeda. Does that make any sense? I don't know. <laughs> It really is kind of a bizarre uh, piece of foreign policy, but that's what's happening. As far as why Saudi Arabia cares, um, well, obviously, they want to control the countries around them. They they essentially want a puppet state so they can have, um, so again, they can open up this port and get, you know, have control of resources and be able to export uh, lots of their oil from the Red Sea through that strait. Does that answer your question? <coughs> they can't just do it through peaceful negotiation or something. They, they feel like war would be, they could get more. They, they're, I'll get to you in one second. I hear, I see you. Um, yeah, they, uh, you know, I, I, th I would love it if they were trying diplomacy, but right now, I mean, in my opinion, in a lot of the activists' opinions, that if we stop funding yeah. this war, Saudi Arabia, they, do they don't really have a means to wage this war without US help. If we cut this funding off, if we cut the military training and selling yeah. of weapons and bombs and military equipment and the mid-air fuelings, this war ends. So mm -hmm. we, are, we have the power here to stop this. I believe not only in Yemen, you have almost the exact same Syria, with Saudi really backing uh, the Al Qaeda in Syria. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, for some reason we are supporting terrorists. And, uh, you know, the U.S. government uh, is, you know, attacking terrorists in one hand, but also supporting rebels that are attacking uh, the Assad regime on the other. So. There is definitely some cognitive dissonance happening there. You're right to point that out. The both proxy wars of the war are between Saudi, between Saudi Arabia and, and <coughs> Iran. They had a good program on PBS about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, these, these are proxy wars that are happening. And, you know, people want to shape their own destiny. And I, I really believe that. We've got to do our best to let countries sort out what they need to sort out politically. Most important question of the night, Cubs or Sox fan? Uh, I'm actually a Red Sox fan. Ooh. <laughs> uh, I'm from Boston. I, you okay. forgive me, please. That's okay. Uh, but, you know, I've been, yeah, I want, I'm going to tread carefully on that question. <laughs> I, I, I saw one, two, three. Okay. okay. No, that, that's you. Okay, yeah. Um, I think maybe in Yemen there might be the war because of the Straits of Hormuz are strategic for oil, so mm -hmm. they want to control that also. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, you know, there, there's several reasons. Also, there is just wanting to be able to dominate your region. You know, there, after the Iraq war, Iran gained a lot of territory, you know, essentially they're using Iraq, Iran's using Iraq to funnel weapons right over to Syria. And they're using Iraq to basically um, escape sanctions. So they're doing a lot of business through Iraq. And so there is definitely uh, some regional power plays going on here. Uh, my point is, though, that the it's overblown to think that Iran is funding this revolution. It's not. Russia has a new uh, ICBM uh, that's going to come out in 2018, and uh, it's uh, capable of, of, of going 30,000 30, miles per hour, and it can avoid radar. And, and Putin says if we do a first strike, they will, he will annihilate the United States. What do you think about that? Um. Well, I'm advocating for a bill that's... That's the question. That's a question. Oh, uh, he's saying... 
What should we do about Russia's new ICBM? Um, and if the United States does a first strike with a nuclear weapon, he'll annihilate us. Um, I'm advocating for no first use with a nuclear yeah. weapon, and there's a petition going around. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I believe that we should not do a first use with a nuclear weapon. I mean, I think it was a mistake in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I think it would be a, a mistake to do it now. As far as what Russia does, I think, you know, I think their power and influence is, it's like they have a lot of soft power, their cyber security is definitely, I think the nature of warfare is definitely changing. It's not people invade, invading your country as much as it is people hacking into your databases and hacking into your election accounts and, and work, you know, trying to undermine your democracy in that way. So, um, you know, yeah, of course, you know, we don't want Putin to have a ICBM that can destroy the United States, but I feel like, you know, we, we knew that they would be attacking, a, you know, that there would be a retaliation if we ever hit them with a nuclear weapon anyway. So I think it's like a non-starter. Um, um, are they still doing that, um, the Saudis still doing that blockade? Um, because I know it was believed that there could be like over 20 million people who are going to die uh, from not being able to get food and stuff because of the blockade. Is there, is, still going on? there is still a blockade going on, and Yemen can't wait any longer. It really can't. This is a very dramatic, dire situation. Um, so, you know, there, there. I believe that there are some land, you know, some spots like in Saudi Arabia that you can still, you know, that are still allowing supplies in. But at one point last year, they they actually blockaded the entire country. And that was very, you know, very dramatic. And some of the pressure that peace action put on in, in this piece of legislation, there was also a vote on HCON Res 81 in the House. And then um, there was another vote as well. So that actually kind of, you know, sh sort of, you know, shook things up a little bit. And the Saudi regime actually opened up some of the ports after that legislation. So this stuff, while we didn't win the war that we're fighting, no pun intended here, um, we, I think this advocacy work makes a huge difference. And, you know, in the lives of people in Yemen. So, any other? Um, I love these questions, by the way. Go ahead. This is good. I, I, I see this uh, uh, if I wanted to contribute to the uh, Yemen uh, uh, issues, would I do it with this? Well, if you want to contribute to legislative advocacy, what she's speaking of, can I hold up? So th these are donation envelopes she was just inquiring about. And yes, all of the donations you give to Kappa goes to working on you know a number of things but the main one right now is ending the saudi led war in yemen so yes we're you know all your donations will go su to support the peace process and just advocate for diplomacy and advocate for some pretty robust lobbying like i said we're doing a uh, a campus all summer long uh, at farmers markets in district 10 district 5 and district 11 um, on this piece of legislation so I would like to know what you think about China's role in all of this stuff coming up and perhaps maybe talk a little bit about their One Belt, One Road initiative. The what? The One Belt, One Road initiative, or you don't know about that? Um, so maybe say more. You know, I, China obviously plays a huge role in the region, right. especially with North Korea. And that's something we can also talk about. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw my question then because it, it's something that I'll... I'll talk to you about offline. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to know more. And do, do, do you think Trump made a bad move by uh, uh, the, the embassy in Jerusalem, that uh, they, they moved it to Jerusalem, where he's going to infuriate 1.8 Muslims? I think it was a bad move, and I'm, I'm for Trump, but I don't like it. Yeah, I, I think it was a, a bad move. I mean, it, it sent a message to Palestinians that America is no longer a, um, a an honest broker of the peace process and that we can't you know that we're not 
on the side of diplomacy and a two-state solution. So, yeah, I think it was a big mistake. Do you think he listens too much to Netanyahu? This and other things? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very unfortunate that that is what's happening over there. I mean, as far as, like, is it placating Netanyahu? I think he is placating Netanyahu. Um, and yeah. he's placating a lot of donors, too. I mean, so this is how our government works. And uh, I, still, I still believe in a two-state solution, and I believe that they can exist side by side. So my family is from Jordan, and we're right next door neighbors. And there's 60% of my family's country is Palestinian. So we know all too well uh, both sides of the story. And you know what my family says? They said, you know, we have no problem with the Israeli people. We have a problem with their government's policies. Yeah. This is what I hear over and over again. So it's, it's, it's really about the leadership right now. So, yes. Actually, let me answer his question, and I'll get to you. <clears throat> um, to what degree would you agree that uh, movements like ISIS and Al-Qaeda are a threat to regional freedom and indirectly to the freedom of democracy? And if so, uh, how, how do you propose the United States deal with it? Yeah. Okay. So, Damn. did you guys hear his question? No. Do you think, uh, like, can you maybe, he wants me to act, talk about the threat of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the region. Because they're players in Yemen and in Syria. Yeah. Now, I definitely think that it's a concern. I think, you know, if they were to gain a ton of power, it would be a threat to democracy. And I also want to make sure that we're clear on a strategy to actually fight this radical ideology. And I think we do that by being an America that's an honest broker for peace in the Middle East. And, a, a bro and doing that means not supporting uh, dictatorships like Saudi Arabia. Uh, doing that means not um, moving our embassy to Jerusalem and angering the entire Muslim world. Doing that means not um, overthrowing Saddam Hussein, not arming the warlords in Afghanistan. So it's like a number of foreign policy initiatives that we're taking up are causing this blowback. And that's that to me, if we started getting getting those decisions right, uh, some of these other things would go away on their own. So, but is that? I have a question. Uh, you, you used Martin Luther King's quote about uh, spending on military justice yeah. leading to spiritual death yeah. um, or military overspending. Uh, have you ever worked with the teachings of uh, Smedley Butler, General Butler? He wore wars a racket, and he, after he retired in 1935, he says, these wars exist to make profits for corporations. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you looked at it from that point of view, teaching everyone that we're in there okay. because of the war profiteering yeah. and oil. Nothing else. All right, we're Andy, what's the question? Things. My question is, do you think it would be more effective if you talked about the corporation war monitoring rather than fighting ISIS or these other small groups that are uh, pop up every now and then to keep the machine going? Are you talking about like the speech I'm giving? Well, yeah, and the, the peace in general, peace yeah. action in general, talk about well, the economics. We, we did, and if you did follow the speech, I actually did mention, uh, you know, CEOs, the stock value of the five uh, largest weapons contractors in that process. So, yeah, we're very aware, and we're definitely trying to educate people of the, the corporate influence of our military and foreign policy decisions. So I completely agree. It's a driving with you. force behind. It. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's uh, a major conflict of interest. So. Uh, I'm curious what you thought about the Obama agreement. Well, not just Obama. The agreement of these a bunch of countries with Iran about the nuclear weapons and what do you what do you think will be the fallout now that Trump has pulled us out of the agreement with 
with Iran about the nuclear weapon? That well, I think if you get the nation of Iran to agree to not build nuclear weapons, that's a safer planet for everybody. I think it's safer for Israel. I think it's safer for our allies in the region. And I think it's safer for Iran, too. As far as us pulling out, they're probably going to start building nuclear weapons again. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. It's, I think it was a major foreign policy so one. Guaranteed problem. And okay. it's something that even uh, members of his own security cabinet, like James Mattis, said we should not do. So, and, uh, and all of our allies in Europe, who also are on the JC, uh, on part of the Iran nuclear deal, also said we shouldn't be, we shouldn't withdraw. Excuse me, can you clear up again for me? Are you against, or you neutral, or you for uh, Trump move uh, embassy to Jerusalem? I would like to know your opinion. I'm against it. Me too. Okay. Thank you. Charlie, last question, and then we'll go to questions around. Outside, you've been talking about an hour and 15 minutes. And not once do I recollect you having mentioned the United Nations. Does United the United Nations. Nations support the UN? Oh, do I support the UN? Does your organization? Yeah. We actually are a uh, NGO that, that sits at the UN, so we are allowed into the meetings and the hearings. So. What about legislation regarding the United Nations? Uh, you know, that I'm not as aware of. Um, it's not something that we're actively working on as an organization, but we support um, the, we do support the UN, and we think it's a really important governmental body. We, we believe in nations coming together to solve problems around the world. So. What about funding the United Nations? Well, sorry, what was that? What about funding the United Nations? You know, well, you haven't taken a position on it. You know, I, that's a good question. Like, I, I haven't really heard Peace Action talk about this. You know, we're we're really focused on foreign policy and uh, you know stuff at the so federal the level. Nations. Yeah, but it's just not something that that I've heard our organization talk a whole lot about. It's a, a really interesting thing to think about, and um, you know, but I'm here. I'm curious in the open discussion part. I'm here. I'm curious to hear what you I, think I've about. I've been a member of the United Nations system <coughs> for about forty years. Yeah, as, and Peace Action is a member as well, so. Excuse me. I think we have, I think okay, that was the why, last question. Well, why, well. Can, I, can you tell me why you're against uh, Trump move uh, embassy to Jerusalem? I have my uh, uh, my opinion. Yeah, why? But what, why do you think? Why you, it's yeah, wrong? Why? Miss, we can't hear you at all. So she he okay. she said why? It's wrong. Why do I think it's wrong for the United States to have moved our embassy into Jerusalem? Um, I I think it makes us not an honest broker for a two-state solution with with Gaza and the West Bank. So in. In that regard, I really support a two-state solution, not just for the Palestinian people, but also for the security of Israel. Okay, okay let's wrap it up and uh, give our speaker a hand. Thank you. Okay, so just watch, sit down and relax. Watch for the rebuttals to come in and. You'll get the last word, and okay, you'll be uh, all right. This is a good thing for the rebuttal period. Uh, can we have a show of hands to see how many people want to get up and give a rebuttal? Uh, is everybody paying attention? Uh, do, uh, who wants to give a rebuttal? Get your hands up, please, so I can see them. One back there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's nine. Okay. Um, Four minutes. Our usual four minutes for the rebuttal. Who's going to be first? All right. Well, first, the mic is open up here. Come on up. Okay. Just hit one more time. Well, there's several uh, things that we're talking about. One is we want to end the war in the Middle East. <laughs> Now, as I remember back to Vietnam, we had a lot of demonstrations all over the place. I remember I uh, walked from downtown 
and to the International Amphitheater, which is about Halston and 35th at that time, when we were demonstrating against the war in Vietnam to hear Martin Luther King. And there was demonstrations all over the place. So there's a lot of people involved in it, from one thing. Another thing, the troops in Vietnam, the American troops, sometimes they sabotaged the war. If the lieutenant told them, tomorrow we're going out and the seek the Viet Cong, what happened if he was alone in his tent or barracks, whatever it was, they would be fragging. Somebody would throw a bomb in there so they didn't have to go. So the United States knew that if they kept going like they were going, it would probably get worse. And that's when we left Vietnam. We know we couldn't win, especially when the Vietnamese had the Tet, the tet Offensive. That's one part of it. So you need a lot of people involved in the anti-war movement. Another thing, somebody once said, I don't remember his name, but maybe somebody will hear, that war is, a, is carrying out a policy that is a, a policy that is different, or, no, I didn't say that. It was, it, it was carrying out a policy by other means, is what they said. In other words, we had a particular policy, and then we carried out with war. And if you look at the uh, history of corporations and how they came to be, and the monopolization of these corporations that happened after the, after the uh, Civil War, for the most part, with the Rockefellers and the other Morgans and so forth, fighting over oil and different things. And when you have corporations, you need large sources of raw materials, you need markets, and you need cheap labor. And that's what war is all about. War makes super profits. And that's what the uh, corporations are always looking for, super profits, where they don't have to use too many workers, or they can make it by any means that they uh, deem necessary. So if you want to do away with war itself, that means you have to do away with, with the capitalism itself, because capitalism makes for corporations. It develops into corporations from, from a so-called free economy where you have these small businesses, and one small business goes and swallows another small business, and eventually they become corporations. So we have to do away with capitalism itself to do away with imperialism. And there's no other way to do it. The capitalism isn't a system that's, last, that's going to last forever. When it, like every other system in history, eventually it dies. Like slavery, feudalism, and now capitalism. It's on its deathbed. But the thing is, it'll fight very hard from going down and use every means possible to stay there. Well, we've got a lot of wars, and one of the big ones that's coming up right now is a war with ourselves. Take a look at all these school shootings. And I got to thinking about this, and I said, wait a minute. When was the last time anyone in an airport was ever shot or killed? It doesn't happen. Why? Because you have a checkpoint. You go to the checkpoint, you take them, there's guns, you take them away. So why can't there be a checkpoint in schools? You have a checkpoint? Outside the school, they can carry guns, do whatever they want. But in the school, no, no weapons. No weapons. 
starting a war or selling stuff to people or in war. And um, I just think that the only way that anybody who is going to solve that problem in the United States is to get, is to have all the people who aren't hyper rich get together and put their nose to the grindstone and making sure that there are laws that benefit the, the working class in this country and the poor and um, and just fighting the super rich. So that's about it. Thank you for this, the talk. All right, there's your proof. We go to war for oil. We go to war with oil. All those countries you should see on that map and all the ones around it either have refineries, tankers in the oceans, in the seas, pipelines, and everybody wants control of all that. And they're all fighting about that. So who's to blame for wars? Yes, gas guzzling, SUVs, Charlie, and airplanes. Of course, not trains. Or, or trucks, because they're more economical. So you mean to tell me then that the, with me driving here, I'm wasting fuel and uh, you were responsible for the war in Yemen? Yes, <laughs> you should have. You should have taken a train. Well, that's a weight on your shoulders. With, with, all, with all with all that stuff, I... unless you prove, come up here and prove me wrong. Oh, I will. We go to war with oil. We go to war for oil. Check that map. I've checked the map I out. I would like for all you, especially you, Tim, to get that map out and check all the pipelines that are in the Middle East, check all the refinery locations, check all the ports, and ch check all the wells. And you do know what my, my solution is to all that, don't you? And thorium's not going to fly oh, an yes, airplane. It will. <laughs> and you know, electric cars aren't going to happen. The, uh, and self-driving cars will kill you and everybody else. Okay, thanks. Don't use oil. <laughs> I hope so. I hope we run out. Oh, yeah. Bombs over everything. That's what it stands for. All right, who's next? Who's next? Okay. Well, we're getting there. If nobody's next, we'll wrap it up. Char come on, Charlie. 
Alright. Give me a second, Charlie. As usual here. Um, I see you, you do lobbying on 1 through 10 of the Illinois delegation, which are all the lefty Democrats from the city. Not Ross, but it's the 11 through 18. You are the downstate Republicans who might be a hard sell on reducing the military budget. The Republican Party, uh, I don't have to tell anyone, is wedded, is pair bonded with the military, as evidenced by the $50 billion that Trump uh, increased the military expenditures by in the last discretionary budget. And if you watch any of his rallies, his supporters cheer. Yay, more money for the Good. for the military. Uh, so that seems to be their sentiments. There's a divide here in the house. Uh, you were gonna say? So you got all the all the lefty Democrats. I'll, I'll tell you what, why don't we switch? You can, you can work the Republican side of the house, but if you can persuade them, there's a lot of money and they've been tied to the military contractors for many, many years and it's certainly not a profound secret or anything, but the Republicans traditionally have been the party for military expenditures in, in that regard. Now the other thing is, I mentioned is, um, and I've been involved in the in the war resistors league for many many years, and they don't do it either. But I can't fault peace action either, or the other groups. But the thing that comes to mind was my thing: if you want to achieve peace in the world, you have to do it through diplomacy. And there's no better vehicle for diplomacy than the United Nations. And as I indicated, I've been an associate member of the UN Association and Citizens for Global Solutions and other support groups, because we figure that that's a proactive, I hate the term, but that's how you achieve this. And I, the one thing, the, uh, the other thing you might want to look at in Congress, I didn't hear, are treaties. Uh, to what extent uh, are treaties being monitored? I think something like 2,000 of them, or I don't know, uh, treaties of various types in the world. But anyhow, some of the peace groups don't, I think, overlook the actions of the United Nations uh, in their efforts towards bringing peace. What this country sorely needs is a president who's a statesman is going to say this is where we're going to put our resources and our efforts and our energies. But instead, you have this scorn uh, on, on Fox Media. And it seems the Russ is uh, probably be an expert on this. He listens to all these, to talk radio. They, they, they like to ridicule the United Nations. I don't understand it. I fully don't comprehend it. I go to conferences there and they do various good things. Why do we have a time limit if we have no speakers? Will somebody please you tell me limit. why we have a time limit when we have no speakers? Because we counted and have lot of the time you know, appropriately. I honestly don't. Now listen, I'm going to let you guys get together next week. But this is not right. And I don't know what you guys are doing, but there's no necessity to have a time limit when we don't have any speakers. And it's about 8 o'clock. Well, I got to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, why do we need the time limit? Why do we need a time limit? I don't know. You two guys. I don't know. No wonder there's nothing. We have a lot to I don't even know what that. The other thing is this group we ought to get into is that I've been trying to interest some of them in without much success is there's an awful lot of gun violence in the United States. 
And it's a natural extension, I would think, of a peace organization to do everything they could to bring about peace in our communities as well as overseas by armed personnel. Now, Mike hit on it. I had to agree with him for once, although it pains me to do so. But there's absolutely nothing of value in this portion of the world except for oil. Uh, he even showed there was a Petra, you know, it, it was a trading center, what, 500 years ago? But today it's, it's, an, it's basically an archaeological site. Uh, civilization seems to have passed this, this place by. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are committed to this resource and fossil fuel. And truly, hopefully, at some time, we're going to divorce ourselves okay. from dependency on oil, and then we can get back to normal world affairs. Anyhow, thanks a lot, and join up, and I hope you can make some money and get some members. You know. All right, thank you. All right. All right. causes of a lot of um, what's going on in the world is, is just the abject poverty that is, um, that is created by uh, the people who are in power, whether they're oligarchs or capitalists or whatever it is. And I think we probably have an oligarchy in this country with the 1% and all that. And we have it in the rest of the world, too, for that matter. And so when we look at the things that go into poverty, why we maintain poverty, it's maintained by the political systems as a way to control people. And it's also maintained by the church who supports the, the, whatever religion it is, uh, institutionalized religion that is an adjunct to the oligarchs in supporting their um, oppression of people. And that takes uh, the, uh, poverty, it, the oppression of people, keeping them in poverty, the oppression of women, keeping them in the second place, um, the, uh, and, and all of the various things that, have, that we've seen here, racism and homophobia and all of the really obnoxious things that have been going on that way. So I think um, until we address some of that more directly, we're not going to get anywhere. And something that has always been on my back burner is the way to address poverty is to address the status of women. If you, it, uh, one of the things that has happened is that you, if you look at the places where the alleviation of poverty and the, and people developing as a uh, society, one of the things that has happened is that it's when you have, uh, when you've done things directly to improve women's status, you do things like education of women. You do things like um, making sure women know that some that most of their children are going to survive to adulthood. You make sure that women have accessible, which means affordable and close enough that they can walk to it without getting shot, and et cetera, et cetera. Some kinds of contraception or, or birth control. So when you have when you raise the status of women. You do a lot of things. You reduce the sizes of the family. You reduce it to, in terms of the number of children because women have a lot of children because they'll have 12 children and two of them will be able to survive until adulthood. So women have a lot of children because of that reason. Um, and so when we reduce the population with this, using those means and raise up the half of the population that are now the majority of the poverty, 
then we're going to really do some significant things about alleviating a lot of these situations. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Speaker. It was very interesting. Um, anyway, Margaret, I thought that was a very good rebuttal. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to mention, somebody had brought up um, the school shootings, and, you know, I have a conflicted thoughts about that issue, so I thought I'd just say a couple things. Um, one is somebody at my table was mentioning, you know, I think she was mentioning, why, why don't we have metal detectors in school? And I mean, if we're going <clears> to, <throat> you know, I, I don't know, I, I hear this argument that, oh, well, we're treating kids like criminals if we have a metal detector. I, I don't really agree with that mentality. I mean, if we're going to let all these people have guns, um, a lot of which cannot, a lot of people think they can handle guns. They think they're stable. I suppose they assume that everyone in their family is stable, and they think they're, res I don't know, they think they're responsible or they don't care whether, they don't think about the issue of responsibility. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's kind of crazy. I think a, a lot less people are, are stable enough to handle owning a gun than they think they are, you know? I mean, a lot of people, oh, you know, I won't have any problem, and then you, you know, the, the wives are shooting the husbands or vice versa, or people get drunk and they shoot each other. Um, so, I mean, I personally, well, personally, I don't, I don't think that any 18-year-old should be able to have an assault weapon. Maybe nobody should be able to have an assault weapon. Certainly somebody whose brain is not fully developed, and your brain is not developed at the age of 18, should not be able to have an assault weapon unless, like, they're in the military. Um, <laughs> And I personally, when I go to a, an airport, I don't feel like I'm being treated like a criminal. Or if I go to the Thompson Center and I have to go through a metal detector, I don't feel like I'm being treated like a criminal. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. I mean, if we're going to let all these people have guns, maybe we should have metal detectors in schools. Um, the other thing, you know, I, there was a really interesting article in the Chicago Tribune um, sometime in the past year about how incredibly restrictive they are in Japan on gun control. I mean, it was it, it was it was amazing, and they in the whole year they had like one murder with a gun that was purchased legally in the whole entire country, in the whole year. So that, I think that's pretty incredible. But I mean, I do support the Second Amendment. Um, however, you know, I was talking to a friend, and you know, um, and he was saying, you know, maybe we should just bring back the state militias, you know, uh, which I think would be rather difficult. But I mean, if people feel like, you know, they need to protect their communities or, um, then, okay, you want a gun, okay, maybe keep it in some armory, or maybe keep it with the people, but you got to join a state, you got to join a, the, a state uh, guard, a state guard, you got to be in the, you know, which is a form of the military, you got to be willing to die to defend other people, um, you know, um, you got to have training on a regular basis. That's what happens in the guard. I mean, unless there's some extraordinary case, let's bring it back. If we need to defend our local communities, let's bring back the state, mili the state okay. um, militias or state guards. Um, because I think what's going on now with all these kids being able to get hold of guns, um, at minimum, hold the parents responsible. You know, if a kid gets hold of the parent's gun, then um, put him in jail for a few years. Maybe that will be a deterrent. Okay, thank you. All right. Our speaker has requested uh, to go next because he has to leave early. We can still take a couple rebuttals afterwards. Can I have the attention of everybody, please? Uh, 20 seconds. Can I have your attention? If you haven't paid the check yet, uh, please.
Um, the waitress is going to give me your checks, and uh, you know, please pay on the way out or help the waitress here. Hey, Heather, Heather, do you want them to pay you here now with yeah, the checks? Please. If okay. I haven't collected, I need the collect. Like, she needs to collect uh, your cards or whatever to, to pay the checks before everybody scatters. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, our speaker gets the last word. He's got to leave early. He's got to leave early, so he's going to take our word. Okay. And if we want to continue with rebuttals, we can. There's an article on Common Dreams today called The War Tree. Common Dreams has an article called The War Tree, and it says, we keep talking about hacking at leaves and branches. You have to go after the root of this in our society. And the root of what's driving the war on terrorism is the poisonous tree that was planted on 9-11. Everything that's going on in the Middle East now, taking down seven countries in five years, that was their plan, to reorganize the Middle East to make it friendly to American oil companies and other big corporations and billionaires, stems from the real estate fraud from New York. Seven buildings were destroyed. They, said, they filmed the first two and said we were attacked by crazy Muslims. There was no Muslim attack on America. We're not at war with Muslims all over the world. It's a myth, and we have to puncture that myth to get our country back. So and hundreds of people are saying that often all over the world, and some people still can't accept it. Okay. But that's it. So thank you, and our speaker will have the last word here. Okay, go ahead. You. Go ahead. As much time as you want. Okay, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate being here. I appreciate hearing all of your thoughts. I appreciate free speech in America. What do you guys say about it? Hey. Hey. Um, you know, I, I don't really know what to say. A lot of people said a lot of things, and you know, some of it I agree with, some of it I don't, but I'm really excited that you guys are here doing your thing. And if anybody wants to become a member of Chicago Area Peace Action, please do. There is a sign-up sheet here. And if folks want to chat with me after, you know, I have a few minutes, but then I have to, I have to roll. But um, for our web audience, how would they get a hold of you or your organization? Yeah, you can go to shypeaceaction.org, or you can email. I I gave one of these, I think, to everybody. And our contact information is on the back. So you can email us through this here, or just go to shypeaceaction.org. Yeah, but the people on the net are not going to have that information, so you need to read it. Get to the recording so people who are watching on the internet can Oh, didn't I just do that? No, I don't know. I just said shypeaceaction.org. Oh, okay, great. I mean, C-H-I. Yeah, C-H-I, peaceaction.org. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Appreciate it, guys. All right. Let's, uh, Andy, you want to gavel us out, please? Unless anybody else wants to do a rebuttal. If there are no other rebuttals, we will adjourn for the night, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you, and we're out. Thank you.